Aloha! Welcome to Science Never Sleeps here at the Bishop Museum. Today we're in the ichthyology department with Dr. Richard Pyle, and he's going to give us some more information about some of the new stuff that's going on with the Bishop Museum and ichthyology. Are yeah, you? hi. So yeah, we've actually been doing a lot of projects recently. Um, a lot of it's in the news, so if you've been following the news, you might have seen over the last couple of months several press releases involving our work. Probably the biggest one and the most difficult for me has been this 20 year long project to explore deep coral reefs in Hawaii. 20 years, yeah, we started a long time ago. Most of it was funded by NOAA, mm -hmm. um, and they gave us a bit of money to use uh, different kinds of technology to really characterize deep coral reefs in Hawaii. Now, when I say deep coral reefs, what I mean is an area that we scientists refer as the mesophotic coral ecosystems. We That's a mouthful. It is, yeah. <laughs> I prefer the term we used to use, which is the coral reef twilight zone. Right. Much more interesting. Basically, it's a coral reef habitat that's deeper than where scuba divers go, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it's shallower than where most submersibles do their research. So it's around 100 feet at the shallower end. Uh, scuba divers can get to about 100 feet pretty easily, uh, but coral reefs go all the way down to about 500 feet. So between about yeah. 100 and 500 feet, we know almost nothing about it. I oh mean, there's, there's, it's suddenly in the last mm, five or ten years, people have begun to realize how important these are. So there's much, much more attention being paid on these deep coral reefs than there was 20 years ago when mm -hmm. we got into doing this stuff. Uh, but anyway, the point is, we have been working for a long time to survey deep coral reefs off Hawaii. And we found some really, really cool habitats. Really cool I habitats. Bet. <laughs> so yeah, like one of, them, one of the most spectacular ones where we spent a lot of time is off Maui where you have just acres and acres of 100% coral cover 300 feet deep. Wow. Nobody had any idea these kind of habitats were, could be so extensive down at those depths. So that was remarkable in itself. Mm -hmm. But we found similar habitats off Kauai. We don't know how extensive and throughout the Hawaiian archipelago these places exist. Related to this project, we've also been working with NOAA and the Papahanaumokuakea Monument right. to explore the deep coral reefs up there. So every you ever Every year, uh, Randy Kosaki, the deputy superintendent of the monument, leads a, um, a research cruise of us deep divers using our deep diving equipment to go down and explore these deep coral reefs up in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. And I think the most spectacular thing we've discovered, among many spectacular things, is that when you get all the way up to Kure Atoll at the very northwestern tip, and you go 300 feet deep, there are coral reefs there where 100% of the fishes are endemic, found nowhere else on Earth, which is really, really remarkable. So a species that's endemic to Hawaii means it lives nowhere else on Earth. And normally here in the main islands on a coral reef, about a quarter of the fish you'll see are endemic. And that by itself was the highest rate of coral reef fish endemism in the world. So Hawaii used to be the, you know, and still is of course, the, the endemism king of coral reef. But what we did was, as we move further up the chain and as we go deeper and deeper, we find that the rate of endemism is higher and higher mm -hmm. to the point where these deep coral reefs are completely dominated by fish found nowhere else on Earth, which is remarkable. And it's important for conservation purposes because it means that there's no other place in the world where this species is, could be protected, not, if not Hawaii. So it's so important that President Obama expanded the Papahanaumokuakea Monument to make sure that that entire area is protected because if they get threatened or damaged up there in the Hawaiian Islands, if they get wiped out up there, they're wiped out across the whole planet because they don't live anywhere else besides there. And we haven't necessarily found all the species that live up there. Oh, yet. no, we haven't. So that's <laughs> another interesting aspect of what we do is discovering new species. Um, I'll mention really quickly, yeah, let's talk about how we, how we do this kind of research. So obviously, scuba divers can go down to about 100 feet, yes. but then there are limiting factors about that. Exactly. That. So conventional scuba gear, divers breathing air, are pretty much limited to maybe 120, 130 feet. Beyond that, it starts getting kind of dangerous for various reasons. Right. Um, so about, actually, it's now almost 30 years ago, um, I started getting involved with mixed gas diving technology. Okay. which means we're not breathing air anymore. We're, we're breathing exotic gas mixtures involving helium and such. And the most effective way to do that is with this kind of equipment called closed circuit rebreather. So this is actually the seventh generation of this line of rebreathers. I started getting involved with the company when they were on version two. Oh and God. so I've been helping them with their prototypes and we've been using these devices to do our exploration and simultaneously helping design these rebreathers to make them better and better and better. So I've been actively involved in improving them. They've gotten a lot smaller, a lot lighter, <laughs> which is good, 
Um, they've also gotten a lot smarter. The computer processors these things have are light years ahead of anything we used to use before. And they can do incredible computations to make sure that your decompression is okay, mm -hmm. to make sure that your oxygen levels are okay, all of these important diagnostic aspects. This kind of equipment allows us to do things we never could have done 10 years ago or more. So, Okay, I'm not a diving expert at all, but for the diving nerds out there, um, what is the main difference between a rebreather to this, this, uh, this right. system versus a regular scuba? So a regular scuba, you have a regulator in your mouth and you have a tank on your back. Mm -hmm. And you take a breath of compressed air from your, your scuba tank and mm -hmm. then you exhale it as bubbles. Now, those exhaled bubbles are gone. And you might think, well, it's exhaled breath, who cares? But actually, air contains about 20% oxygen, mm -hmm. and when you inhale that 20% oxygen, which is what your body needs, you need to exhale the carbon dioxide sooner than you used up all that oxygen. So in fact, when you exhale, those bubbles that scuba diver exhales are about 19% oxygen, 18% oxygen. So most of the oxygen is just being wasted. Okay. So the way a rebreather works is instead of exhaling your breath as bubbles, mm -hmm. it captures it and recirculates it through the rebreather. Huh. And so the rebreather does two things. Your body consumes air to get oxygen, mm -hmm. but then you have to get rid of carbon dioxide. So the rebreather's job is to get rid of that carbon dioxide and replace the oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so, as its name implies, rebreather, you're rebreathing the same breath over and over again. And every breath you take, you remove a little bit of oxygen and, and exhale a little bit of carbon dioxide. And then as the breath goes through the rebreather, the rebreather eliminates the carbon dioxide in a filter mm -hmm. and then replaces the oxygen using one of these oxygen supply tanks. And because it's so efficient, we're not wasting any gas, this tiny little tank will last me six, seven hours underwater. Oh my God. Whereas a regular large scuba tank, if I breathe it in scuba mode at 300 feet, six or 10 minutes. So, oh. yeah, so that's <laughs> it's much, much, much more efficient yeah. and much safer if you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So that's what the technology is that really allowed us to explore these deep coral reefs where previous researchers never had a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, this project we did in Hawaii was very, very, very interdisciplinary. We had 16 collaborators from all kinds of different organizations. They were doing all kinds of different research, you know, corals and fishes and invertebrates water chemistry, light, uh, current, temperature, all of these different factors um, with all of this different team of scientists. My area of specialty is new species discovery. That's what I do, <laughs> particularly fish new species. And in Hawaii, we've actually had such a long history of exploration. There aren't that many new fishes to be found, but we have found a few of them. And one of them, here, I'll show you this picture, is this spectacular butterfly fish. Now, this one was in the news recently. Um, we didn't just discover it, we actually discovered this butterfly fish almost 20 years ago, but it's taken us this long to get proper specimens so that we can give it a scientific name. So we just recently named this fish, it's called Prognathodes basabei, named after Pete Basabe, who lives on the Big Island, he's a very experienced diver and fish collector. And so we finally were able to get the specimens necessary to give this thing a proper scientific name. That's what it looks like alive. And you can actually see this out at the Science can, Adventure Center yes. uh, on our bottom floor. So if you want to see one of these in real life, you can come down to the Science Adventure Three Center. Three of them, in fact. Three yeah. of them are live, swimming around in an aquarium. So definitely come down and check those out. And that's an unusual behavior for these angelfish, having being seeing and being in threes, right? Well, that's weird. So there's there's probably a hundred species of butterfly fish, or not quite a hundred, but there's a lot of species of butterfly fishes, and this is the only one we know that we consistently find in groups of threes. Mm -hmm. Most butterfly fish live either in pairs, a male and a female, or in large schools or large groups. Um, sometimes some species of butterfly fish, like the long-nosed butterfly fish, you will occasionally find them in groups of threes, okay. but not consistently. This species. Almost every time we've seen them, there have been three of them. Not two of them, not one of them, not four of them, not seven of them, three of them. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very interesting. And we've only been able to examine them internally to see which are males and females on two sets of these threes. And in both cases, wow. there were two males and one female. So I don't know if they're all two males and one female, but that seems to be what the pattern is. All right. Well, and here, good. yeah, so here are the actual specimens. This is what they look like once we preserve them. And if you look around, this collection is just full of fish specimens like this. 
Um, so these are the ones that once we collect them for science, we have to preserve them in alcohol. So these are stored in alcohol. And these are the holotype specimens. One of them is the holotype. When you name a new species, you pick one of them and call it the holotype. And then the others become paratypes. So that's very critical. And these jars you see behind me, every red ribbon you see, every red cap is a holotype. So this is our this is where we keep our holotypes over here. And that's the that's the that's the specimen that defines the species. That's the specimen that defines the species. Exactly. When you create a new name for a species, you pick one specimen and that name is linked to that one specimen. And the reason they do that is if you have three specimens and you, you think they're all the same species and you name it as a new species, but you later discover there's actually a couple of species in there because they're really similar looking, you need to know which one the name goes with. So that's why the name gets attached to one specimen only, the holotype. Awesome. Great. We have one more new species we wanted to show, if I may. Yes, please. So this doesn't look very impressive now. Um, I'll take the lid off and you can look inside here and you'll see two tiny little you know, lick, they don't look all that exciting or impressive right now. They're much prettier when they're alive. They've got some beautiful colors. <laughs> yeah, bright orange, really spectacular. So what makes this fish interesting is, first of all, it's our most recently discovered new species. Mm -hmm. We discovered this only in May of this year. Um, totally unexpected. It was in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands at Curie Atoll, and we found it 300 feet deep. And when I saw it for the first time, I did a double take. I said, what is that? That that I have no idea what that is. It's not uh, very often you come across a new species. No, right? not in Hawaii. <laughs> we find them in other places, but not so much in Hawaii. So we collected one male and one female specimen. And we discovered them right about the time that President Obama was contemplating expanding the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, the monument, the, the Papahanaumokuakea monument. And so we decided that if he did end up expanding the monument, which he did, mm -hmm. we would name this fish in his honor. So this is a fish that's going to be named after President Obama later this year. <laughs> I'm sure well, uh, President Obama has a lot of different species named after him, but this one <laughs> This has, is the coolest. This is the coolest, yeah. And I'll, had... I'll tell you why this is coolest. There's two reasons why this is the coolest. First of all, it's the only species we know of of fishes that's endemic to the monument itself. In other words, all the other endemic Hawaiian fishes we find in the monument also occur here in the main Hawaiian Islands. Oh. Right now, this is the only one that has only ever been seen within the monument. So given that President Obama did such a great thing in expanding this monument, it's very significant that this endemic Hawaiian fish is not just endemic to Hawaii, but endemic to the whole monument. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty exciting. But there's another reason. The male of this fish has a little spot on its dorsal fin. Mm -hmm. And when I first saw it, that's what first dragged my attention to it. It's like, I don't know any fish that has a spot like that. And when it was alive on the reef, that spot was blue around the middle, and it was red in the center with sort of wavy lines. <laughs> and when I saw it, I thought, that looks a lot like the Obama campaign logo. And so the Obama logo with the blue O and the little red and white stripes in it is very reminiscent of the spot on this fish. So it's always, it was almost like perfect. Everything was absolutely perfect for why we decided to name this fish after the president. Now, it has to go through a vetting process, right? And that takes several months. So yeah, it, it takes a bit of time. Until well, it, probably mid-December. That's what we're going to shoot for. It's mid or late December of this year. Um, and, and we hope the president will take it upon himself to come visit our Journeys exhibit uh, featuring the monument that he just uh, expanded. And, you know, we could show him the holotype of his new species named after him. And uh, it. and it'd be great to have him come visit the uh, museum. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. You have so much great information. Um, if you want to come and see uh, here at the Bishop Museum, please visit our website, bishopmuseum.org. Schedule your visit today. You can come see our Journeys Northwestern Hawaiian Islands exhibit, learn more about research that Richard does and other scientists around Hawaii, and come see the live, uh, the live specimen of our fish, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> of the butterfly fish. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much. Thanks absolutely. for joining thank us. Thank you. Join Thanks. us next time. We're probably going to take a little bit of a hiatus with Science Never Sleeps, but join us in the new year. We're going to talk more about science then. Until then, ahui ho. Aloha. Aloha.